Howdy folks, my name's Sir Aaron, also known as William, and today I'd like to take a little bit of a leaf out of Matt Colville's book and begin making a campaign diary series for my Burning Wheel Exalted games. So if you've been following this channel for a while, then you'll probably know that I've um, recently been working on an Exalted-themed expansion for Luke Crane's Burning Wheel game. This is a tabletop role-playing game, and it's one that I've come to be very fond of. As part of playtesting that game, I've started running a second campaign, in addition to the one that I'm still running with Denati. This secondary game follows three Solars in the northern city of Fortitude, and it is in this video, and perhaps in videos to come, that I will be basically doing a, a campaign log, taking a leaf out of Matt Colville's book and telling you about what's been going on in these games. So as with my Dragonblooded game, this Solars series is being played on Discord and with Roll20. So I've recorded all of the audio for these, uh, for these three sessions that we've played so far, and the Session Zero, or part of the Session Zero. Uh, and I've put them in the video description. And as with all good Burning Wheel campaigns, we began by talking not about characters, but about setting. I did a little bit of background reading around places that I would be interested in setting a game in Exalted. And the two sort of major locations that I decided on were the North and the South. So then I did some further reading. I read parts of the second edition Northern and Southern Compass Direction books, and I also reread the Threshold uh, chapter of the lore in the third edition Exalted book. Then I took some notes and proposed these locations, um, such as Dajaz, Paragon, Chiaroscuro, uh, White Wall, Gethamane, Tusk. I, I sort of reeled off. Uh, a lot of these locations to them, told them a little bit about them, and asked which ones uh, they found most interesting. And the one that they decided upon um, was Fortitude, which I believe is a new town, uh, or a new city, uh, to 3rd edition. I, I can't find it on the map in 2nd edition. Fortitude was once a prison fortress. It is now a large city where only the most strongest and most ruthless survive and rise to the top. It is a place where darkness is worshipped, and deep underground, in old mine shafts, dwells a primal forgotten god. This is what I told them uh, during our session zero. This intrigued a lot of them and um, got them to come up with some character concepts. Uh, initially, we just wrote down some, some very basic ideas, so we had things like uh, someone wanted to play a gangster, uh, someone else wanted to be like a tribal um, person, maybe a shaman, or just a, like a brawler. Um, and the third uh, player wanted to... he wasn't quite sure, but he, he knew he wanted to have a character that had some relation to this underground secret god, uh, and he he wasn't sure whether he'd be a sort of philosopher or a priest or a doctor. But he, he came upon a, a very interesting character in the end, and I'll talk about them shortly. I'll, uh, I'll put a map up on the screen. This is what I drew um, during the week between session zero and session one. As you can see, it's, it's kind of abstract. I wanted it specifically to be abstract, just to be evocative rather than to be, uh, you know, a strict uh, map in the, in the traditional sense. And I think you'll agree that it looks pretty cool. <laughs> At least I'm proud of it. Um, so we talked about the city a little bit more and we tried to sort of flesh out the setting a bit. I read a ri little bit more about that area from second edition where Fortitude is now placed and it's basically a, a sort of, I guess it's, it's basically Scotland <laughs> in terms of the landscape. It's like lots of moors and mountains and, uh, and lakes and rivers and stuff. And Fortitude, from what I could picture uh, from reading a lot of the descriptions of this city, is that it's a, it's like a scar on the landscape. Like, it used to be this old underground prison, 
and people just forgot about it, and the people who live there now kind of have this self-inflicted um, hatred or in inherited sin, and so I think it's a it's kind of a crazy town. <laughs> Um, and to sort of emphasize that, I drew up a picture of it where I kind of imagined it was like hanging in this crevasse and that the, the crevasse was almost like, um, yeah, like a, like a wound on the landscape that was festering and like molding and stuff. And the, the city itself was like growing out of this crevasse, which was like... Once I had that in my head, I knew, like, this was going to be cool. So then we we started uh, talking about characters and, and how, how we actually wanted to play the game. Now, if you're not familiar with Burning Wheel, I won't go into too many de details about it here. There are f many, many far better explanations about it um, elsewhere. In fact, I'll leave some links in the description. But the important thing about Burning Wheel is that the whole game is built around uh, character motivations that unlike certain other um, role-playing games out there, um, a lot of what the players are doing is not actually up to the GM, it's purely up to themselves. And the most important part of your character sheet um, in a burning wheel game is the front page where your beliefs, your instincts, and your traits are listed. And these are things that you write yourself. Well, the traits get assigned to you with um, character creation rules, but the beliefs and the instincts you write yourself, and they can basically be like a three or four lines up to a short paragraph. Usually you want to try and keep them brief. But they are statements about what you want to do in the game and how you want to portray your character. And they have mechanical effect. It's not just flowery. It's like, this is how you get the game's equivalent of experience points. Um, by following your beliefs, by letting your instincts get you in trouble, and by invoking your traits in interesting ways. To me, as a GM, I kind of plan events, but I don't have a, a set story in mind when I'm running Burning Wheel, compared to how I might run, uh, or compared to how I've previously run Exalted and compared to how I've run any other game before. Um, and I find it actually kind of liberating to have that pressure taken off me as a GM. It means that most of what I do is just rules, um, rules interpretation and refereeing and um, giving florid descriptions and being interesting as another player in the game, albeit serving a different function. So enough about Burning Wheel, what we decided is that it would be most interesting if Fortitude itself was the kind of primary antagonist for this uh, campaign. Not that the city is sapient in any way, but that collectively the city is against the players and they have to struggle against it to get what they want, to fight for their beliefs. With this in mind, um, we, we kind of began to continue to drift towards this kind of gangster route where we decided that um, a whole bunch of different creeds and groups, cults and gangs, were um, ruling the city in various parts of the city. So what we decided on in the end was that there was a sort of political coup where one of the strongest gangs took over the city um, and declared themselves the new leaders about six months before our game begins in-game. Um, and these are the Silver Masks, um, and they're sort of... They're very rich and organized and... Um, kind of aristocratic and probably, honestly, the most sort of sensible rulers um, for this town. But the players disagree, um, and sort of that's where the, the driving conflict comes from. Um, and the players want to basically put somebody else on top. They want to 
uh, get one of their own gang members, or perhaps even one of themselves, if there are no suitors, um, to go and stage their own political coup and take over the city instead. Um, on top of that, there's potential for other factions outside of this city to come in and try and sort of probe the town to see what happened. So there's basically a lot going on, not to mention all of the stuff going on beneath the city, um, either in the old prison and uh, or further below, where there's like cultists live and where there's like forgotten, uh, forbidden god is. So yeah, let's let's talk about characters. So. We spend the rest of session zero, um, yeah, discussing our characters and making them uh, using the very in-depth character burner and the rules that I'd written for um, putting uh, Exalted into the context of Burning Wheel. So we have um, one knight cast Solar, whose name is Callow, being played by Robert Leyland, uh, who also has a YouTube channel, I'll put his link in the description as well. Uh, he runs D&D games. Yeah, his character Callow is basically a a, um, a gang enforcer, or um, he his, his original, original concept was kind of like Necromunda. Um, but yeah, so he came up with this girl called Callow. So I guess we should begin with the, with the beliefs. So Kalo is basically all about staying alive right now. Um, she has a couple of quirky things about her. Um, for example, her primary belief is about um, overthrowing the city and uh, installing a new figurehead and so on. Um, so this is the sort of like guiding light belief for Kalo for the whole campaign probably. Um, and then her second belief seems to change between sessions, and it's more situational. And her third belief is about getting money, and just surviving in this city um, that seems to be out to get her. Finally, she has a trait called Zealot, which gives her a special fourth belief um, that she has written to basically say... So she is filled with religious fervor about the Solars themselves. She's learnt their true purpose, she's learnt that the Immaculate Order is false, and her zealot belief says, the Solars were, uh, were usurped by those who once served them and are now demonized by the people. In time, the Solars will take their place as the true masters of creation once more, and I must pave the way for that glorious ascension. <laughs> Which I think is amazing. Um, and that is a belief that is as long as she keeps bringing up the fact that Solars are important now that they're back in the world, um, this is a belief that's just going to keep getting her in trouble and that she's going to keep being able to win fate for, which is fantastic. Um, beliefs have changed a little bit, but they're... Uh, my safety must come first, forget about everyone else. When I see coin left unattended, I help myself. And when I have someone at my mercy, I spare them. Additionally, Solars have um, Limit, which is a function of the Great Curse that I've written into the Exalted Wheel um, add-on for Burning Wheel. Um, and the way that it works is that it gives you a fourth unique instinct um, that is both the trigger and response to your limit breaking. Um, and... The way that it works is basically if the event that triggers you uh, occurs and you witness it, then you have to roll your limit to prevent yourself from getting, uh, from from uh, just acting out the instinct. So unlike other instincts in Burning Wheel, this is one that you have to actively prevent from occurring instead of one that you choose to invoke. <laughs> Um, and so it can get you into a lot of trouble, but it hasn't actually, uh, hasn't actually happened yet. That said, I think it could happen fairly soon for Kalo. Her limit instinct is, if my true identity is, it, uh, is ever in danger of being revealed, I will use any necessary force to suppress it. Um, and then she has a lot of traits, and I guess I'll just read them. 
um, but I'll only do this once for each character. Um, so Kalo's traits are wretched, filthy, cruel, cynical, thug, guarded, bleak sense of humor. She is an essence wielder. She's blessed by the sun, which is, uh, some of these are to do with her just being a solar. So that's also lawgiver and limited. And then the, her other die traits and call-ons are Rain Woman, Alert, Cold-Blooded, Jaded, Zealot, Street Smart, and Poker Face. She is a cold, hard woman. <laughs> um, and yeah, the majority of her character skills revolve around being a gangster. So she has um, things like <laughs> arson, brawling, climbing... Um, darkened streets-wise, gangs-wise, intimidation, inconspicuous. Um, but then she also has some quirky ones like oratory and philosophy and um, dancing. So I think Kalo is a very interesting character and I'm excited to see where she goes next. And Rob has been kind of playing her to the hilt like pretty well so far and he's managed to earn... Um, quite a lot of fate off of her uh, various instincts and traits, which is which is good and beliefs. Then we have Meso Abelard, who is Oliver's character, and uh, I love this guy. <laughs> I just love this guy. He's great. He's um, let's see. So he's this like crazy um, heretical doctor um who's like enthralled by the city of fortitude he just he loves every piece of fortitude with every inch of his body and wishes only to express it and and give it good health and uh, his character is basically he was you know city born and then uh raised as a or, or uh, became a student and got educated and uh, became a doctor and then he exalted as a solar and went kind of crazy so he's a zenith uh no he's a twilight cast excuse me and immediately after exalting he went into the outcast setting and became a thinker for 12 years which to him just meant going down into the um into the barrows and the mines uh deep beneath the city and just L just thought for 15 years about stuff. <laughs> um, and then he... Uh, that That's sort of where he met this forbidden primal god. Um, and he dumped a huge amount of his skill points into learning a very special um, knives and surgery-based martial art, um, which we designed together and is hilarious. <laughs> um... And then he... What did he do last? His last life path was Engineer. So he basically went off and joined an army or some kind of military group um, and, yeah, became a, a technician for them. And so he also has a very high engineering skill. Uh, yeah, and he's a surgeon. So, like, Meso has a lot of very good skills, uh, including philosophy and um, inconspicuous... He has strategy, artillerist, engineer, astrology, uh, yeah, anatomy, surgery, and bloodletting, uh, and fortifications. And then, yeah, he has a B7 in his, uh, in his special martial arts skill. So Meso is a very powerful character. I think he's the oldest uh, of the group. Um, everyone has six life paths, but your age, instead of the number of life paths that you have is what determines more how, how, how powerful of an exalt you are. Um, a lot of things um, such as bonus resources and starting essence exponent and uh, bonus skill points are determined by your, uh, the, the amount of time that you have spent as an exalt. So those, those 15 years of thinking really helped him out a lot. <laughs> um, Let's see. So Meso's beliefs uh, have changed a little bit, but his first one remains constant, and this is my favorite one of his beliefs. It is, I am fascinated and enthralled by every part of this city. 
I will take it to pieces and reassemble it until I know it completely, and it is completely mine. The time has come for Thanamortos, this is a character that he introduced to the game with his uh, relationships, um, to begin serving his part for my purpose. I will defeat him and force him to serve me. Um, so earlier in the game, this is actually a new, be new belief for next session, I think. Um, but earlier in the game, he was talking about trying to take down the silver man. Yeah, his other instincts have changed as well, so I'll not read these out. Um, but he's basically all about, like, it was his idea to, to bring down the silver masks and to, to reinstate the new order. Um, and he's a little bit crazy. Um, so I love it. It's great. Uh, his instincts, he's got one about always using his martial art, uh, when he's, when he's fighting. Um, he has, oh, that's it. Yeah. So he has the painting skill, um, but he doesn't have the composition skill, uh, he does have read and write, thankfully. Um, but, and he also doesn't have poetry. But his instinct is, every morning at dawn, address my love to the city by painting it with my poetry. Which I love to just imagine is like nonsense words. Just like he, he graffitis as much of the town as he can with as much paint as he can. Uh, with just nonsense words and really, really bad poetry. Um, and I think it's fantastic. Uh, and then his third instinct, he we kind of talked about this. He might be changing this, but he says, um, uh, Never refuse a game of chess in case I get a second chance to learn from a god. Uh, and we sort of said that like this primal god that he met down in the pits basically challenged him to a game of chess. And he won by total fluke. He doesn't have the strategy game skill. Uh, and his reward was being taught this super badass martial art. Uh, and then his limit instinct is, when I see a person killed by someone's negligent mistake, I will enact justice on their killer by leaving them with a crippling reminder of their guilt. <laughs> Which is terrifying. <laughs> These characters, I must say, are not good, and thankfully there's no alignment system in Burning Wheel. Yeah, and then his traits are creepy, pale-skinned, frustrated, rabble-rouser, smart, unclean, essence-wielder, blessed by the sun, lawgiver, limited, that's just part of being a solar, and then geometric, uh, and sense of distance, and then he also has palsy, which has yet to actually get him in any trouble, but will be hilarious when it does. <laughs> uh, and then he's also driven and nimble, as colon traits. Uh, yeah, and then his, his relationships are this, this primi primordial, uh, or, no, sorry, no, it's definitely not a primordial, um, but it is a forbidden god, a very powerful forbidden god, and, uh, he also got a, a an enemy cultist called Thanamortos, who, uh, he keeps trying to, to sort of throw into difficult situations. Finally, we have Svela, the man-eater of the Mammoth tribe. Uh, and she is a, um, she is an ice walker from the far north with giant's blood in her. One of her most important traits and something that she actually spent a lot of trait points on is the die trait massive stature, which mechanically only increases her weapon range by one. But in the case of uh, like, descriptions, it means, like, she doesn't fit in doorways, um, she's, like, yeah, she's just huge, and then as a character trait, she also got Drop Dead Gorgeous. <laughs> so, she's a huge, beautiful woman, and, uh, pretty much all of her life paths are in the soldier setting. She was a bannerman, then a foot soldier, and then a sergeant, and then a veteran, and then she exalted as a Dawncast Solar. So she's a young, like, freshly exalted Solar. Um, so despite being slightly weaker, um, she does still have a grey shaded brawling skill, um, and she has some huge Oracalcum gauntlets uh, that she swings around and that I've basically given to her and described as being... Um, they, they basically count as a shield, gauntlets, and a mace. <laughs> um, and, uh, 
so yeah, she's a, she's a pretty strong character. Um, she just she punches stuff, and she intimidates stuff. Um, she she definitely has the fewest skills, um, but I guess she's also the most focused. Um, but I think that's also a byproduct of her just being a, a slightly younger exalted compared to the other two characters. So we'll see. Uh, over the course of the campaign, like, whether Sphaler actually feels underpowered or not. But in terms of raw stats, she kind of is. Um, then her beliefs are... Ah, yeah, that was it. So she is... She's undecided as to whether um, Callow's... Um, the, the gang that Callow is in, Rob's character, uh, is called the, the Hogs of Fortune. And Callow has suggested that... Um, their gang boss, this, this fella known as Godo the Schwein, uh, that Callow has suggested that he should become the next ruler of, uh, Fortitude. And Svela is unconvinced, and the only way that she will become convinced is by fighting Godo. It's so, um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, as I go into detail about the actual sessions. But she's basically, uh, her beliefs are written about fighting stuff. Uh, her third belief is sort of her guiding light belief, and it basically just says, I do not believe my strength is adequate to complete my goals. I shall strengthen myself through battle. Which means, until she decides that she's adequately strong enough, she's never going to get Persona for that. But as long as she's fighting stuff every session, she's always going to get Fate. Um... And then her second belief is about not trusting the other two. I do not trust my fellow exalts, and I must show them the value of honor and trust. Uh, again, this one's like, how do we decide whether this is complete or not? But I think it's basically up to Scott. And then her first belief is currently missing, but it was about fighting Godo and sort of proving to uh, herself that he's a, a worthy leader. And if it ends up that uh, he isn't worthy, then she's going to, um, you know, do something else. And then instincts are insults uh, to my honor are a challenge to a fight. I do not hesitate to begin one. I will only stop fighting once I fall unconscious. Surrender is the coward's option. And drinking is the best reward. After a good fight, I shall drown myself in ale. Then her limit instinct is if my friends are ever in grave danger... I shall rush to their side to protect them, no matter what. Um, so these instincts have yet to properly get her in trouble, but they very easily could. Um, and then traits are forsaken, honored, drop dead gorgeous, shows no fear, uh, essence wielder, blessed by the sun, li uh, lawgiver, and limited. And then she is also stubborn, has a massive stature, and is tough. Um... So like I said, she's just a beautiful, huge woman from the north. Um, and she had a single floating resource point right at the end of character creation. And I convinced Scott to take a negative um, relationship, uh, an older brother who hates her uh, for being stronger than her, um, instead of taking shoes. So Svela has no shoes. Uh, but she has a, an older brother who hates her, who I've yet to properly introduce into the story, but that might happen soon. So yeah, let's talk about sessions. We've had three sessions, um, and they've been kind of slow, but we're getting there. So the, the first session opened with uh, the characters basically talking about what they want to do. Um, and because we'd already had this conversation outside of the game, uh, we basically opened the, the whole campaign with these three characters, um, Svela, Kalo, and Meso, all just sitting in a room uh, with the, the sort of opening statement being, so we're agreed. Um, and sort of then we got initial descriptions out of the way, there was a little bit of chitter-chatter, and then Meso, Oliver's character, immediately said, all right, now that you're all my friends, <laughs> come with me. I want to go and gloat to Thanamortos about how much better I am than him. <laughs> so the, the players agreed, uh, and 
they they headed down into the sort of cultist's layer, um, and the name that we came up for uh, these like underground cultists was the Frostgrave cult, um, and Thanomortos, this enemy character of Meso, is a sort of sniveling, um, kind of. A nasally annoying character who's a, a cultist and a possibly a shaman um, and who um, <laughs> I decided outside of his house in this uh, underground cave area which I guess is a sort of like old uh, slave house um, area for the mines um, whilst they were still in use and they've now kind of frozen over mysteriously um, he outside of his house he has a shrine dedicated to himself, uh, so that just just to give you an idea of like how uh, what what kind of a character Thanamortos is. Um, so Meso immediately went to this guy's house. They had to sneak around some guards first, um, but then once they got there, uh, they basically just interrogated and gloated at Thanamortos to make him feel bad, <laughs> and then left, <laughs> and that was about it. Oh no, no no not quite. Meso decided to paint a lot of uh, obscenities on his house with his red, uh, red paint, um, and then they left. Um, then, following that, they went up to, like, back into the old prison area uh, to go to the Hogs of Fortune's um, pig pen, uh, which is their sort of guild hall or their main headquarters, um, where... Callow went up the stairs to go and talk with Godo to basically tell him about their idea that they want to put him on top and in charge of the whole city. Um, but in the meantime, whilst Callow was talking to Godo, uh, Meso and Svela wanted to come up too, but the guards wouldn't let them and they started causing a scene. Now, Godo is a huge, rotund man. He's very, very large, very wide, very tall. Not as tall as Fela, but still like 6'3". Um, he's bald and has a huge, big, bushy mustache, and he's heavily, heavily tattooed. Um, I wanted to paint a picture of this guy as being absolutely um, disgusting and just sort of made you sick to the bone to look at. So he has like rotting teeth and like black gums. Um, he's like shirtless almost all of the time. Uh, he has two wives, one of them is heavily pregnant, and when Callow first walked in on him, uh, he was having sex with both of them. Um, and yeah, he's just, he's not, uh, he's not a nice man, but, um, he's an inspirational man to the people of this city, or at least to the people of the lower city. Uh, and he rules, um, he rules them very well. Uh, in his opinion, at least. So when Svela starts causing a fuss and he comes down to see what's going on with Kalo, uh, and Svela was basically saying, I want to fight you. Uh, I want you to prove to me that you're good enough to rule the city. He was basically saying, lol, what? Well, I don't need to do that. Shut up, go away. And in the process of attempting to convince him uh, that this was a good idea, uh, Callow lied to her boss and said, Hey boss, don't worry about it. Look, I, I've, I've seen Svela kill ten of Bruder's men. Bruder is the, uh, the leader of the Silver Masks. And uh, Godo saw through Callow's lies and said, How about you come back when you've really killed t uh, ten of Bruder's men? And then uh, sort of left the conversation at that, and uh, and had Meso and Callow thrown out um, of the of the pig pen. Just before uh, Meso could be thrown out, though, he got the chance to circles up um, a lock picker. Um, so right at the end of the session, we did a circles roll, and um, Meso had this idea that he wants to try to get to Bruder. Uh, this is when he still had a, his belief written about getting to Bruder, the Silver Masks. Um, he decided he wanted to go through another gang, um, Baba Ozu, the leader of the uh, the slave cult. Uh, or, sorry, no, he's a slave mag uh, magnate. Um, so just a, a very wealthy, fat merchant businessman 
type fellow who owns a lot of slaves. Uh, he wanted to go through him and um, get to what he calls the fettered sorcerer, um, whom he will use in some fashion to, uh, to get to Bruder indirectly. Um, and so he decided to call on this lock picker uh, and asks to meet him uh, at a bar, which I think we named uh, the Bristly Crown. The Bristly Crown was the name of the bar. So he met uh, he met this lock picker um, in the in the Bristly Bar and basically convinced him to help him break this fettered sorcerer uh, out of Baba Ozu's clutches. Um, meanwhile. Callo goes off to, uh, w within the pig pen, goes off to find her, um, basically the, the guild or the, the gang's, um, sort of paperwork man, the, the administrator, uh, and the guy who hands out a lot of the jobs, and she goes up to him and says, hey, you got any jobs? And he says, yes, actually, I'd like you to also, um, sort of, this was me thinking about how can I get these two characters to do stuff in the same area. So I had him uh, describe a job that also involved antagonizing Baba Azu um, to release some captured cave boars uh, who he was trying to sell uh, in the market. Um, and so he wants to um, release them and send them off and, and cause chaos or, or potentially uh, free them back into the caves. So that sort of set things up for session four. Um, but in the meanwhile, Svela um, wanted to go and kill ten of Bruder's men, and Meso wanted to show Svela around town, and those sort of lined up. So it took a little bit of goading, but Meso and Svela's plans are not completely out of a line. Um, and Meso had a belief written about this where he wants to show Svela around the town to sort of encourage her to believe in the city in the way that he believes in it. Svela is kind of disgusted by the city. Um, and I actually don't know off the top of my head why, uh, other than like out of game Scott is a player reasons, um, why Svela as a character has come to Fortitude uh, except to strengthen herself. Um, and so Meso wants to instill the belief in Svela that this town is worth serving and protecting and that it's beautiful. Like, and, and, and Meso is like trying to pin his obsession onto Svela as well, uh, which I think is, is an excellent idea. And so by part of that, the next day, uh, he and uh, Svela go up to the top of the town um, into Silver Mask territory. Actually, just before that happened, uh, whilst Mesa was in the bar, uh, a mysterious woman showed up and attempted to assassinate him, but he narrowly escaped. So the next day, Meso and uh, Svela and Kalo, sneakily following them, um, make their way up to the top of the town. Uh, they don't go to the Tower of Joy, um, the, the big sort of central tower in the middle of the city, um, but they go not too far away, uh, a similar, maybe slightly smaller tower uh, elsewhere in town, but still controlled um, by the Silver Masks. And they basically just go up this tower and start fighting Silver Masks. <laughs> um, meanwhile, Kahlo has been following along and just decides to, to try and nick herself some breakfast. Um, unfortunately... Rob forgot to give Callow the sleight of hand skill, and so Callow had to do the test unskilled and um, failed badly and got caught by some other silver masks uh, and started getting dragged away um, to a gallows to be flogged for her theft attempt uh, to be taught a lesson. So that went very poorly for Rob's character. Um, but meanwhile, Svela and Meso basically uh, wrecked shit, uh, to put it bluntly. Though it was mostly it was mostly Svela. I kept giving Ollie some opportunities to join in the fight, but he only joined in right at the end. For the most part, it was Svela just punching people's faces off. 
um, which I gave a lot of opportunities for Scott to do in fun and interesting ways. And uh, the Dawncast got their, uh, their anima involved. Uh, I believe Scott described it as being like a huge um, sort of golden mammoth rising up behind her, uh, within, her within the flames of her anima. Um, looking terrifying and, and horrific. Uh, and, uh, yeah, basically, Svela pummeled onto these guys and ripped their faces off and punched their heads and broke their necks. And, and um, yeah, it took probably most of the second session um, to do the combat, but it was a lot of fun uh, for, for, I think, everyone involved. Um, uh, even though Rob... I kept trying to give Rob opportunities to escape, but he kept failing the roles <laughs> that I that I gave him. Uh, so in the end, Rob Rob's character just got dragged away, and Meso and Svela were completely oblivious to um, Rob even being in trouble to begin with, or sorry, Callo even being in in trouble to begin with, because she'd followed them sneakily, and they didn't notice her following them. Um, so. At the end of this battle, Svela and Meso are dripping with blood. Uh, there are bodies everywhere. They have their ten masks, uh, these like silver masks that all of these gangsters wear. They have ten of those um, that Svela wrote a belief about. You know, going to going back to Godo, going back to the the Schwein, the leader of the uh, Hogs of Fortune and throwing them at his feet and saying, there you go, I've killed ten of Bruder's men, now fight me. So she's got these ten masks, and but they're still in Silver Mask territory, and they need to get out fast. And Meso decides to try and circle someone up. Um, we decided that, uh, through a wise role, uh, that Callow was going to be flogged in a nearby market square known as Faculty Square. And the name of that alone implied that there was, like, a, a university or some other, um, you know, uh, academic institution nearby. And uh, Ollie used that information to circles up um, someone else who was a, like, previous professor or doctor or something who taught him to become a surgeon. Um, but he failed the circles role, and it was a difficult obstacle. Uh, yes, it was an obstacle for Circle's role, which he got zero successes for. Now, margin of success doesn't really matter that much in um, Burning Wheel, at least not for Circle's roles, um, but it was just kind of funny that he needed this character right here, right now, in the middle of trouble, and he got nothing. <laughs> um, so this, they show up to this doctor's office, um, getting chased by guards, and they want to try and convince him to, like, protect them, to, to say, oh no, these are just, you know, escaped patients, they're crazy people, this is their own blood, they've injured themselves, these aren't the people you're looking for. But because of the failed circle's role, um, I had this doctor character, this professor, uh, not remember who Meso was at all, and so, to, from his point of view, two screaming maniacs covered in blood just broke into his office and started, um, you know, tearing through his cupboards and pulling his curtains down to, like, cover up their bloody garments. Uh, and Meso was, like, trying to convince him to, to help them, but he wasn't having any of it, so he starts screaming bloody murder. The guards show up, and Svela just grabs him by the head, uh, and jumps out of the window. <laughs> uh... Meanwhile, Rob's character, Callow, um, was about to be flogged on this gallows in the middle of Faculty Square, not too far away from this doctor's office. And I gave Rob a couple more opportunities to attempt to escape. So first he tried another sleight of hand attempt to get out of the ropes that he was bound into, um, but failed. And then I gave him the chance to... Uh, or, well, then he decided to, instead of trying to escape, he would just orate. And uh, there was a woman who turned out to be the woman who had attempted to kill Meso the night before. She'd stepped up onto the gallows and began orating to the crowd and talking about how under silver hand, sorry, silver mask rulership, um, that this was a good and glorious thing, that the flogging of thieves and other uh, lowly criminals is the way that the Silver Masks will be um, 
you know, instilling their their leadership and their rulership and so on and so forth. Uh, Callow, being a zealot, was having none of that, and she stood up, and her anima started flaring, which looked like sort of um, heat waves mixed with black smoke began sort of emanating off of her body, and she started saying with this booming voice, like, no, it is the Solars uh, who are the divine rulers of this town, and I will show you uh, that, that we are better than all of you. She failed the oration roll. Um, and because her animal was flaring, it basically caused the entire crowd, about 60 to 80 people, to just panic. Um, I think I said about half of them either fainted or started begging for mercy, and the other half just started running around aimlessly screaming. Um, and at that exact moment, Svela crashes out through the window uh, into this street of panicking people uh, and sees... Uh, Callow on this gallows uh, in front of her and basically just walks up uh, not giving a single shit about all of the guards that are still chasing her um, and says give me Callow back and I'll give you this doctor who she's still hanging on to by the head um, and it took a little bit of intimidation a little bit of bargaining I believe but they did it they managed to get um, their uh, the, the, the trade was successful, and the masked woman, the mysterious masked woman, um, kept her end of the bargain. She released Callow and got the doctor back and had her soldiers hold off on chasing Svela and Callow. Meanwhile, Meso had successfully gone incognito and just disappeared into the crowd, um, and as they were walking back down into the old town and escaping from all of the madness, uh, Meso reappeared himself and just began casually talking with Callow about their next plan of action. Meanwhile, uh, because of her instinct, um, Svela decided to head to the nearest bar, which of course was the, the Bristly Crown, um, and they all got roaring drunk. <laughs> Which was a big mistake, because they then decided to go and enact their next phase of the plan instead of sleeping off the hangover. So, session three ended uh, with a drunken Svela heading back to the pig pen uh, to go and talk to Godo, to throw down the ten silver masks at his feet and say, I challenge you to a duel! And that's where we left with Scott, because I want to have that fight play out properly. And uh, I didn't want to just jump the fight rules onto Scott without giving him a chance to read them, because they are kind of complicated. Um, and Meso and Callow went down, back down, into the dark tunnels, into the icy uh, old mining shafts. And they went back to Thanamortos' house, um, which had been, you know, cleaned up a bit from yesterday. Um, and they managed to sneak through his house into his basement without him noticing. This is at, like, the dead of night now. Um, and they sneak into this old couple's... or Sorry, not an old couple, but a, a couple uh, who are living in this guy's basement, uh, who he basically, like, leases to. Um... And Meso's plan was basically to get Callow to use her intimidation skills uh, and her, her skills as a professional thug to get, these, to get this couple to just leave the house. To say, you know, bad shit's gonna happen, get out. Uh, we're giving you this opportunity to leave peacefully or we're gonna kill you. And it went poorly. <laughs> it went very poorly. The man panicked and went for a knife and tried to attack Callow, but in that instant, Meso's uh, instinct kicked in about um, fighting people with his super godly martial arts skill. And the room turned into a rainbow disco ball, and he pulled out a single scalpel and slit the man's throat. And he isn't dead. But he suffered a superficial wound, I believe. No, not a superficial. Ugh, no, a midi wound. Um, and it's bleeding heavily. 
Uh, and I had his sort of steel reaction to being wounded just be that he passes out. Um, and due to him not being healed before the end of the session, it's now progressed to a traumatic wound. Um, <laughs> so he's in bad shape. He's going to die pretty soon. I don't know if, if, uh, if Ollie cares about that or not. Uh, probably not knowing how crazy Meso is. Um, but Callow isn't about killing people. She, she has an instinct that says, you know, when people are at my mercy, um, don't kill them. You know, be merciful. Uh, and so this woman who just saw her boyfriend or husband or whatever get his neck sliced is about to start screaming in terror. Um, and Callow grabs her by the throat and says, don't scream. Don't do anything. Just shut up and stay quiet and we can fix this and it'll all be okay. And he failed the role again. <laughs> and so the woman started screaming. And that's where we left off with session three. Um, so it's going to be really, really interesting to see what happens next. I'm really excited. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Last session was especially fun. Um, and yeah, it's just going to be, it's going to be fun to see, uh, to play out that reaction with Thanamortos and the Screaming Woman, uh, cause like, Thanamortos is definitely going to hear the screaming in his basement and come down and investigate, and there will be a brief opportunity where Meso and Kahlo may be able to fix it in time, or they might just give up and try and kill everybody. Who knows? It's anybody's game. Meanwhile, there's also Godo to deal with, with Scott. Um, when we finished the session, Scott and Godo had gone down into a sort of sand fighting pit, uh, where the rest of the Hogs of Fortune had gathered around to watch and were cheering and shouting, and the match was, like, just about to begin, so I think we're gonna open session four with that fight. And sort of, I might do a thing where I cut back and forth between exchanges, uh, in the fight, um, to see what's going on uh, down in the gutters, down in Thanamortos' house, uh, just so that for um, Ollie and Rob, like, they're not getting bored just watching, just listening to this fight. They, they can actually do something uh, in between as well. Um, and what else? Yeah, so then there's also, like, immediately following that, which we should also be able to get done in session four, they'll be finally going and meeting Baba Ozu, uh, or maybe not meeting him, but going to his, you know, grounds within the city uh, and interrupting some stuff there. So Meso wants to go and uh, release this fettered sorcerer, um, who I haven't quite decided about yet. Um, but he wants to release this guy from prison and, and persuade him to work for him, to help him bring down the silver masks. Uh, and there might, well, we'll see, but there might be a duel of wits there. Uh, and Callow has to basically release some pigs, uh, and cause some havoc, and do it, uh, without drawing attention back to the Hogs of Fortune. Um... So there's still a lot to play for, and uh, I think, yeah, it's going to be probably one or two sessions now before we get back on track to doing, like, actually bringing down the Silver Masks, but after next session, the characters should be in a pretty good position to, like, start enacting stage two of their plan. So yeah, I'm, uh, I'm really excited to see how it goes, and uh, yeah. Uh, if you've watched all of this, then thank you very much. Um, I hope to do more of these. I might try and do them on a regular basis instead of, uh, doing three sessions and session zero all at once. Uh, you know, like four sessions. They could be a monthly thing, or I could try and do them once a week. We'll see. They're all, they'll obviously be a lot shorter, uh, if I do them every week. And I will also be uploading the, the actual audio recordings of these sessions, uh, and they will be in the video description. Anyway, uh, thank you very much for watching. Uh, if you've enjoyed this, I'd appreciate it if you share it with anybody else. Um, and if you have uh, campaign diaries of your own that you'd like to show to me, then by all means, uh, let me see them. So yeah, thanks for watching, and uh, see you next time.